The title this morning is Honoring the Dishonorable. And I was reflecting on some of the songs we were singing this morning, and one of them had the phrase in it, I will live my life for you. Now, this is important that we become people of our word, that when we say we will do something, that we in fact seek to do it. And this was highlighted for me when I was at Lowe's with, who did I have with me? Joey, Luke, one of the other kids, Landon. And uh, they were with me. Jen had the other two. And we divided and conquered yesterday. And I had something to return at Lowe's. And so we're there in line. And the lady, I just remember her name was Janet. She was very nice. And she goes, okay, boys, I got a question for you. And they all, eyes real wide. How many books are you reading this summer? The question no boy wants to get during summer break. (laughs) And they all were like, like, look at me like, Dad, help us. I'm like, hey, answer the question. They're like, um, none. And she goes, okay, you need, to, you need to read two books this summer. And you're older, you need to read at least four. And she goes, will you do it? And they're like, yeah. And I go, whoa, whoa. If you say yes, I'm going to hold you accountable to read those books. And Joey goes, maybe. <laughs> Smart kid, right? (laughs) The point is being a person of your word. So when we sing songs like, I will live my life for you, it's like, whoa, 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 wait. If you're singing that, are you meaning that? Will you live your life for him? Because if you are not willing to do so, do not sing those words. Be a person of your word, be a person of integrity. And if that is your desire, you're like, but I can't do it. At least try right? Seek to live for the Lord. And I think it's important for us to realize that as followers of Christ, the goal as as a pastor is for me to encourage you to live your life for the Lord. For me, myself, my family and I to do so, to encourage you to do so, that we wouldn't just come here and be consumers of a product. Because our culture creates us to be consumers. Look at your trash cans the day before trash day. Have you ever took account of how much you consume? How many things we consume we don't need? And we get in this constant cycle of products in, consumption is made, and products out. Amazon is really good at helping us to get conditioned to the shipment cycle of things that we think we need. But people treat church the same way. We seek to consume a product. But if you're a consumer, then you also become a critic. You become someone who takes a product, you evaluate it, and then you complain about it or you approve of it, either way. But if you are a co-worker rather than a consumer, then you have a vested interest on what's actually being accomplished and done. Then instead of critiquing, you actually become a part of making things more excellent and being a part of God's kingdom rather than a critic of it. Does that make sense? So let's not just be consumers of a product. And that's the big battle is that we, we get people coming to church, but are they living like the church the rest of the week? Because if you just come here and you just agree with what's going on, but then your life doesn't change, if my life doesn't change, then... Where's the impact? Where's the true value of what we're doing here? The value is in lives changed, of faith strengthened, of equipping you and I to live life no matter what comes our way. Amen? And so today, we start day one of 2 Samuel. Yay! Now, don't get too excited because really 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel were one book at one time. So we're really halfway through, but it's a good transition point. And I have to kind of bring you up to speed on where first Samuel ended because second Samuel begins right at the same place. But it's important for us to understand the purpose of first Samuel, which is the rise and fall of Israel's first king, which is king. Good. And he is symbolized as man's choice man's king, and we see how that failed God's people. 
uh, how he failed God's people, and they fell into his sin as well. But the purpose of 2 Samuel is the rise of God's king. Who's that? David. David. And it very much points to the true and coming king who has come and will return again, which is Christ our Savior, signified as the son of David, the one who would come. And so last, well, two weeks ago, because that was the last time we were in 1 Samuel, we took a break for Father's Day, we saw the demise of Saul. The beginning of the book is his rise, the end is his fall. It kind of makes sense, but it's not a very uh, glamorous fall. Um, You've seen people sometimes trip and they fall kind of slow motion and they gracefully you know, tumble on the concrete and come up like they meant to do it. Have you ever played off a fall? Anybody like, oh, forward roll. And then you just walk it off and everybody's like, wow, that was impressive. And then there's the ugly, nasty fall. The one that it happens and it keeps, you just see it getting worse and worse as they fall and crumple. That happened to Joey yesterday. We were in the front yard, they're riding bikes and he tried for some cool move. And all of a sudden we hear this smack and he falls. And he keeps rolling, and his limbs are getting entangled in his bike as they keep rolling. It wasn't a pretty fall. It was ugly. And Saul had an ugly fall. Although he popped up, and he was like, I'm good. Uh, Saul did not get up. Saul was down, and and he never got up again. He, He fell from grace, and it's a very unfortunate end to Saul. And I just want to read for you this account at the end of 31, because we get a contradictory account in the first chapter of 2 Samuel. Now, the people, the people will say, the Bible contradicts itself. If you do not understand context, if you do not understand what the Bible is saying, then you might come to that conclusion. And you'll see here today that there's two accounts of the same event, and they differ in major areas, because one is true and one's a lie. Okay, that's why. And it's meant to be displayed as that. So let's read 1 Samuel 31, verse 1. It's just a review, so I'm not going to have you stand yet. Uh, we'll do that in 2 Samuel. But this is what happened to Saul. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Remember, this is that great battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. Saul was in great fear. He sought counsel from a medium. Uh, someone who consults the spirits of the dead or demonic spirits, which he was not allowed to do biblically. And so Saul went into this battle already having lost, spiritually speaking. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. And the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. So three sons died in this battle. And the battle pressed hard against Saul and the archers found him and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Right there we know the armor bearer shows himself to be honorable in this instant. It was against the law of God to kill another, especially the king and the Lord's anointed. So he was not willing to break God's command in doing so. Uh, And when his armor bearer saw that Saul, oh, nope, wait, but his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore, Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. Take special note of these events because they will be contradicted in the next chapter. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled and the Philistines came and lived in them. We see this as the supreme example of God rejecting Saul as being king. He was called to be king. He was chosen to be, but he proved himself unworthy. He lived dishonorably, and so God allowed him to be judged in this way. Are there consequences to living against God's word? Yeah. Here's the thing. 
um, God kind of stacked the deck against those who would disobey him. He gave us his good word, the law, the things that are meant for our good, and gave us the realization that this is how we should live, but we also have the ability to live contrary to that. But he did not create the world in a way that if you live contrary, you're going to have God's blessing in those things. There's going to be consequences, and sometimes it takes time for those consequences to reveal themselves, does it not? It's sometimes the first experience or the first act in an area of sin, you don't see the damage. But after repeated exposure and repeated participation, the damage reveals itself. Sometimes it's in the first act and it's done. You know, there's those substances that there's a progression to the addiction and there's others like I think it's um, methamphetamines that in one use, you're, no, heroin is the one, one use of it and you're absolutely addicted from one shot, one experience. Sin can be a gradual addiction or it can be an instantaneous one. Either way, we shouldn't participate in it because we now know what that sin is and we have a personal experience with it and we can now have the enemy, Satan, using it to tempt us in ways we would never be tempted before. And so Saul is rejected because of his conduct. He is cut off by the Lord because God said in Leviticus 20, verse 6, if a person turns to a medium or necromancers whoring after them, I will set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. And so God cut Saul off. He was then, we read at the end of 1 Samuel 31, that the Philistines came, they stripped the slain, meaning took all the things of value off of the dead soldiers of Israel, and they came across King Saul and his sons, stripped their bodies, um, decapitated him, hung his body and his head on their wall as a trophy. And then... Um, the, the men of, I think it was Jabesh Gilead, which Saul saved at the beginning of his reign as king, they mustered up their forces, rescued back the bodies, burned them, and then they buried their bones. Saul was a dishonorable man who died a dishonorable death. He was not well honored. But David, see, that was all God's doing. God allowed it to play out that way. But David had an obligation to show honor to someone who did not live honorably. And I want you to think about different funerals and memorial services you've gone to. Is it appropriate to speak poorly of the deceased? No. It's a big cultural no-no. There's times in which, okay, any one of us, when we pass, there are going to be those who could stand up and say things about us that aren't very nice. Right? Right? And they're, oh, I'm just being truthful. No, you're being a fool. That's not what you do. You show honor. You show grace. You allow grace to cover a multitude of sins in those moments. And you choose to focus upon the good that that person possessed, that they modeled, and that you focus on those things and celebrate the good in their life. But why should that only be appropriate when they die? Why shouldn't we focus upon that while they're alive? Why shouldn't we celebrate the good things in one another than getting obsessed with the deficiencies we see in others and that we're blinded to in ourselves? So we should seek to show honor, and that's much of what we're talking about today, the honor that David shows a man who does not deserve it. So we're going to see the rise of David, which begins with the fall of of Saul. The three sections this morning is the contradictory account, David mourns for Saul, and then David honors the dead. So why don't we read 2 Samuel verse 1 together. You'll notice from the beginning that this account of Saul's death is going to vary greatly from the one told us at the end of 1 Samuel. So stand with me in honor of God's word, please. 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 1. <coughs> There's two sections to this. The news of Saul's death and David's response. And the last half of this chapter is a song of lament 
that David wrote in honor of Saul and Jonathan. Verse 1, after the death of Saul, when David had returned from striking down the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. And on the third day, behold, a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And when he came to David, he fell to the ground and paid homage. David said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, how did it go? Tell me. And he answered, the people fled from the battle. And also many of the people have fallen and are dead. And Saul and his son Jonathan are also dead. Then David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? And the young man who told him said, By chance I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and there was Saul leaning on his spear, and behold, the chariots and the horsemen were close upon him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called to me, and I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me, stand beside me and kill me, for anguish anguish has seized me, and yet my life still lingers. So I stood beside him and killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the armlet that was on his arm, and I brought them here to my Lord. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. And David said to the young man who told him, Where do you come from? And he answered, I am the son of a sojourner and a Malachite. David said to him, How is it you were not afraid to put your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of the young men and said, Go execute him. And he struck him down so that he died. And David said to him, Your blood be on your head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. And David lamented with, his, with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan his son. And he said it should be taught to the people of Judah. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. He said, Your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Eshkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty." Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. You can be seated. One thing to note is David's great grief, sorrow, and lamentation over a man who in every way has proved himself to be David's enemy. David showed himself loyal to Saul all the days of Saul's reign. There wasn't a moment that David rebelled against Saul. He sought to please the Lord by serving the one in authority over him, even when that person was seeking to kill him time and time again. Jealousy fueled much of the sin that Saul committed, and yet David continued to show honor to a man who was dishonorable. It brings an illustration to Jesus' own words about blessing those who persecute you. Pray for those who speak evil of you. That is not a good teaching of Jesus. That is a hard, perfect teaching of Jesus. That is something that is expected of you and I. How can we possibly do that? How can we speak good of those who speak evil of us. Only by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit 
can you and I, you and I do that which is not natural to us? There are those who are given the divine ability to speak well of those who speak poorly of them. To show honor because it's the right thing to do. Even when given the opportunity to speak truth that would display another person in a poor light. David never spoke poorly of King Saul. Did he have reason to? He could have easily, can you believe what King Saul just did? This is the third time he threw that stinking spear in my head while I was playing songs for him. Not only that, every time I sleep, I don't know if one of his assassins is going to be there leaning over me with his sword. You know, and then this and that. And do you remember that time? He was relieving himself in the cave, and I, ha- I could have just taken him out right then, caught him with his pants down, and it would have been over. But David never did that. So we never have an excuse to do that. To take opportunity to make others look bad and ourselves look good. This chapter shows that Jesus, Jesus, well, David, picture of Jesus in this, came to the throne in innocence. He was without blame. He didn't seize the throne. He didn't take it from Saul. But God gave it to him in God's timing that David was on the run for many years. This was not a quick turnaround. It took many years. And even when he goes back to Judah and he reigns in the city of Hebron over Judah, it's quite some time until he reigns over all Israel because the house of Saul keeps giving him trouble. And we'll see that shortly. But let's look at verse 1 together. It tells us the time frame of when this happens after the death of Saul. When David returned from striking down the Amalekites, Remember, there was two major events happening simultaneously. You had Saul and Israel fighting against Achish and the Philistines over here. And then you have David who returns to his city in Ziklag and has to pursue the Amalekites who had burned the city and taken their women and children. All that was happening at the same time. David delivered his family and all their possessions and returned back to Ziklag and was there for two days before he gets news of what happened at the Battle of Gilboa, which we read about now. So he remained at Ziklag for two days, and there was a three-day delay for the news agency to reach David. Now, back then, there was no posts to read. It was not instantaneous like it is now, but it was by foot, by horseback, by camel, by some means necessary, this messenger comes to David. But really, if, if you look on a map, you have Ziklag down in the south where David was. 25 miles north is Gath. 25 miles north of that is Aphek. And about 25 to 30 miles from there is Mount Gilboa. You add that up, that's a 75 mile journey in three days. That guy was booking it. I'm willing to bet he was not on foot. We don't know. It is possible, but most likely he was not. Verse 2, on the third day, behold, a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn, dirt on his head, and when he came to David, he fell on the ground and paid homage to him. So here's this messenger. Let's make some initial observations. Uh, Just this morning, I had my two older boys with me. I stopped off at a donut shop to get some coffee. I don't always drink, but I did this morning. That's why I'm talking really fast right now. (laughs) And uh, we walk in, and there was a gentleman wearing a Marine Corps shirt and hat and just made an observation. And so there were some things I could tell about him. And so before we left, I shook his hand and said, you know, thank you for serving. And you could tell he was, he appreciated it, but was a little embarrassed, but very thankful. And my boys, you know, looked him in the eye too. And And we left, and I said, boys, it's important to make observations of people when you see them. You know, like, well, did he? And they started to ask me questions how I knew. Well, did you notice this? Did you notice this? Well, same thing happens when you've got somebody running at you or riding towards you. You're going to start making observations about that guy. Do I know that person? Okay, I don't. Can I tell anything about them? Well, his clothes are torn, dirt's on his head. That's the traditional posture and attire of someone who's grieving. 
okay, this is not good news. This is bad news coming my way, right? He's a man. He's of military age. So maybe he's coming from battle, bad news of a battle that happened, but David is still not aware of what it possibly is. This guy could be a lone survivor. But this guy is a messenger, but it's different than the stories of Pheidippides. Hard name to say. I've had to practice it before today. But Pheidippides is the myth that is told about the word Nike or the goddess of victory. Pheidippides is the guy who, when the Athenians were in battle against the Persians, who were much bigger and stronger, the Athenians won a battle, and Pheidippides is the messenger who made the 26-mile run from the plains of Marathon to Athens to announce the Athenian victory. And upon reaching the city of Athens, he made his way into the center, and he proclaimed one word, the word Nike, and then fell down dead from exhaustion. That's how the myth goes. There's certain stories about it that it wasn't actually 26 miles, which is why we get the 26.2 for a marathon today. Um, but it was more like 75 miles or even 100 miles, and it was a different battle and so on. So there's multiple accounts that the truth is somewhere in between. But that was a message of victory that resulted in the guy's death because he was exhausted. This messenger, it's, it's similar yet different. He brings news of a battle, but instead of victory, he brings news of defeat. And yet the similarity is that bringing this message resulted in his death as well. Not because he was exhausted, but because he lied. And his blood would be upon his own head. So let's look at verse 3. David now begins to question him, which you would as well. Where do you come from? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. So now David knows that it's the battle that David was almost fighting again. Remember, he was living with the Philistines. The king of Kish wanted David to be his bodyguard for life, wanted him to fight with the Philistines against Israel. God saved David from that obligation. But David knows full well that the Philistines were fighting Israel and fighting King Saul. So it's news of that. And David said to him, how did it go? Tell me. And he answered, the people fled from the battle. And also many of the people have fallen and are dead. Saul and his son, Jonathan, are also dead. Now, there's two points to this message. The people fled from the battle, meaning that Israel is in full retreat. That was very bad news. The last time this happened, the Israelites were in defeat and in full retreat was when God decided to judge the wicked house of Eli. Remember Eli the priest, who Samuel, at the beginning of 1 Samuel, took his place, place as the priest over Israel? Eli was replaced because his sons showed hatred and contempt for God's offerings, and they were wicked, and their father Eli did nothing about it. So God judged that house of Eli, and they were removed from the priesthood, no longer allowed to serve. God does the same thing with Saul. He judges the house of Saul, replaces him with David, and removes that family from serving as king. So just as Eli's house could no longer be priests, Saul's house could no longer be kings. Because of their contempt for the Lord's sacrifice and the Lord's word. That is no different for you and I today. If you show contempt for the sacrifice of God, which was his own son on the cross for sure your sins and mine, and you have shown hatred for God's word by rejecting it, then you are replaced and removed from serving the Lord and enjoying Him for all eternity in heaven. You are cut off and removed from God's covenant and His blessings if you show hatred for the sacrifice and if you reject the word of the Lord. Those are the two things every human being is required by God to accept. The sacrifice of Christ and the word of the Lord to you and me. Life is not that complicated. The foundation of life is not some mystery to be found out. God has revealed it to you and I. Accept the sacrifice, keep the word of the Lord, 
That is your life's goal in a nutshell. Make sense? And that's what we see here with Saul and his family and Eli's family as well. The messenger, the second point, is not only that Israel is in retreat, but many have died or fallen. More specifically, the mighty have fallen, which is King Saul and his son Jonathan. Now, how many sons of Saul died in this battle of Gilboa? Three. The messenger only mentions King Saul and Jonathan. Why is that? Because he knew David was loyal to King Saul. He was the next in line, the anointed, to be king. So that would be important to David to know. But also Jonathan was his greatest of friends. And David loved him dearly. So what this messenger is doing is he is seeking an opportunity to get favor with the next king of Israel. And he decides to change some of the facts, to tell the story in a way that promotes his own name and cause in the hopes that he would have a position of prestige in David's court. And yet it backfires on him horribly. Lying usually does, does it not? Verse 5, then David said to the young man who told him, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I love what David does here. David is checking his sources. And it is a major issue in the gathering of information and truth today. I want you to think about our culture. I want you to think about the explosion of information in our generations that are alive today and in our culture. Never in human history has so much information been so accessible to everybody around. You used to actually have to go to a library, find a book, and research to find information about things. Now you could do it in a matter of seconds by typing it into your phone. Almost anything you want to know is at your fingertips and mine. But here's the thing that happens today, and it's a major issue. Very few people alive check the source of the information. They see a blip of a news article. And without even reading the article, they accept it to be true. Is that not right? How many articles have you read the title of, but not the article? Thousands upon thousands all the time, and we make snap judgments about that information. We'll maybe even read an article, but we don't check to see if it's actually valid. We don't see the purpose. There's a website called Babylon B, which is a satire. Meaning the information is not true, but it's making a critique using false information on purpose. It's actually a Christian website, but it uses satire to shock and get somebody's attention and see what's going on. And if you don't understand that, you're going to walk away believing things that aren't true. How many people today make judgments about theological beliefs, what they believe about God to be true, the Bible, other people, well-known people and culture, and they don't actually check the source. Do we not have the greatest source that has ever existed in human history that has never been proven false? So when you've got some person somewhere with letters after their name that says this is true and it contradicts this that has never been tr proven false, why would you believe them and not this? It is not being closed-minded to say, I believe what God's Word says because there is nowhere ever has this been proven false. And it has been attacked by people throughout generations trying to destroy it, discredit it, and it has never been successfully done. Any other book that exists in the world today had all that attention and effort been given to try to prove it wrong, those books would not be accessible. You would not be able to buy them. They would not be in print. They would be extinct. Yet for some reason, this book that is a bestseller every year 
printed and published more than any other, read more than any other, cannot be proven false. This is the greatest source that exists today. And you know what? Many people don't even check it. They just accept things about it. Because if somebody says it contradicts itself, then they can go, well, then I don't have to read it. Or it's just the words of men. I don't have to read it. Why would I just read words of men? Have you heard these arguments? David is checking the source of this information. He doesn't want to act upon information that might not be credible. Don't you think you and I should do the same? Did you hear what so-and-so said about you? Oh, and then you start acting upon what is said, not even finding out if it's valid or credible? You could ruin relationships and families based on information like that. Check your sources. Do not just believe them. Don't be naive. And also, there are people, there are news outlets, there are purveyors of information that exist today who intentionally give false information, intentionally misleading the American people because they think the overall result will be good, so it justifies their immoral use of information. Also, there's a spiritual side in which Satan gives lies on purpose to destroy and mislead in the hopes of leading more people to hell. So, checking information, making sure that you are believing the truth is extremely important for you and I. Verse 6, the young man tells David, he says, by chance I happen to be on Mount Gilboa. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, you should not believe in the concept of chance. Chance implies a universe that is out of control, that is not being guided towards a destination. You see, God is sovereign over all things. It was not chance that, that allowed that man to be on that mountain where Saul died. It was God's sovereign hand that allowed it. It's not by chance that you're here this morning. You freely chose to be here, but it was God who directed your steps and enabled you to be here to hear God's word this morning. I love what A.W. Pink said in his book, The Attributes of God. Listen carefully to this concept of God in our, now it's the 21st century, but he wrote in the 20th century. He says, the lowercase God of this 20th century no more resembles the supreme sovereign of holy writ than does the dim flickering of a candle, the glory of the midday sun. The God who is now talked about in the average pulpit, spoken of in the ordinary Sunday school, mentioned in much of the religious literature of the day, and preached in most of the so-called Bible conferences, is the figment of human imagination, an invention of maudlin sentimentality, a God whose will is resisted, whose designs are frustrated, whose purpose is checkmated, possesses no title to deity, and so far from being a fit object of worship, merits naught but contempt. That is how Pink saw God being communicated in the world in the 20th century, and it hasn't been much different. God oftentimes is promoted as very small. One who can be resisted at all times, who is not very awe-inspiring or worthy of worship, and yet the God of Scripture is. He does as He pleases. He rules over the heavens. We're told that Saul was leaning on his spear, and behold, the chariots and horsemen were close upon him. This is where we start to realize this guy's account of what happened to Saul isn't legitimate. And, and I'll tell you why. There, there's a few reasons why, but let's read his account first. Verse 7, And when he looked behind him, referring to Saul, and he saw me, and he called to me, and I answered, Here I am, O king. Verse 8, And he said to me, Who are you? I answered, I, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me, stand beside me and kill me, for anguish has seized me, and yet my life still lingers. Now, he's making himself look really good right now. Like the king of all Israel asked me and Amalekite to stand by him and give him the honor of taking his life so the Philistine scum did not take his life. So I stood behind, beside him and killed him because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the armlet that was on his arm and I have brought them here to my Lord. That is the story 
he told. And yet there's many contradictions, and I'll read them for you. Between the original account at the end of 1 Samuel and this account, number one, the original account said the archers found him. This guy said the chariots and horsemen hard pressed upon him. He got that wrong. Then number two contradiction, the original account said Saul made the request of his armor bearer, but this guy says, no, Saul asked me to kill him. Contradiction number three, the original account said the armor bearer would not kill Saul, but here the messenger gladly killed the king. The next contradiction, number four, the original account said the armor bearer followed Saul and fell upon his sword as well, yet this messenger, instead of taking his own life, escaped. And then Saul died and his three sons. So which account should we believe? And I had to wrestle with this. Which one's true? Is there a way that both of these are true? Or which one's more favorable? Well, the end of 1 Samuel is an account that is meant to record the historical event as it happened. This account is a messenger who has motive to change the facts for his own benefit. And that's what is revealed here by the way in which David treats him. We see that what really happened is Saul was wounded by the archers. He made the request of the armor bearer to kill him, who would not break God's command and kill the king, the Lord's anointed. So Saul fell upon his own sword when the messenger said he leaned on his spear. They were very different implements of war. Saul carried a spear, a sword, and a shield. He was leaning on his spear, but he fell upon his sword. And that Amalekite surely stumbled across Saul after he had died and took the crown and armlet as, a, as proof that the king had died so he could bring it to David, get favor with David, thinking that David would be excited to hear that the king had died. And yet he horribly misunderstood David's feelings on the matter. The only thing that mattered here is that David had proof that Saul had died. It was his crown and his armlet. This is very important to note. Saul wore his crown into battle. There's one thing my dad told me about Vietnam. My dad was a first lieutenant, meaning he was an officer, and he had men under his command. And whenever you were out in the field, you did not want your men saluting you because it made the sniper across the way know who he should kill first. You don't have any insignia that highlights your position of authority out in battle. You want to just look like one of the other guys. But Saul was too proud for that. He wanted the recognition, so he wore his crown into battle. Who do you think the archers were aiming for first? The guy with the shiny thing on his head. Doesn't make sense, right? But here you have pride coming before destruction. And that's exactly what happened to Saul. He ended up being a very proud man, which led to him falling horribly. Do not let pride lead to your own destruction. Whether it's relationally, whether it's professionally, whether it's spiritually, pride will cut your legs out from underneath you and make you fall on your face in front of others. And so the account was true. Saul had died. So David took hold of his clothes, tore them, and David grieved over Saul. They mourned and wept, fasted until evening for Saul and Jonathan, his son, for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. David said to the young man who told him, where do you come from? And he answered, I am the son of a sojourner in Amalekite. Who are the people that David just killed off? Amalekites. You know, the ones that God said to Saul, yeah, I need you to wipe them all out. Saul didn't wipe all of them out um, like he was supposed to. David had been doing so. Now David finds out this guy's an Amalekite, not a Jew. And David knows that he is well within his right to execute this man because he was a sojourner he was subject to the laws of Israel. He had killed the king. It was a no-brainer. 
So David said to him, how is it you were not afraid to put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? This is where the conversation went really bad for this messenger. He started to go, "Uh, uh uh-oh, this is not what I expected. He was expecting to be exalted to a place of honor because he brought this great news to David. Then David called one of the young men and said, go execute him. And he struck him down so that he died. And then David said to him, your blood be on your own head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. See, David is saying, I am not responsible for your death. You are responsible for your own. And this is a picture of what I see at Jesus' own crucifixion. When he was handed over by Pontius Pilate to be crucified, and Pilate washed his hands of the matter, and he says, let this man's blood be upon your own head to all the Jews. And they even said, let his blood be upon us. Let we be the ones who are to blame for killing the Lord's anointed. Wow. Do you see that parallel? You are not to kill the Lord's anointed. And yet you and I in our own sin are the ones who killed the Lord's anointed, are we not? The anointed of the Lord, the anointed one is the Messiah. That is Jesus. He was anointed by God to bear the sins of many upon the cross, to become a curse for you and me so we could be blessed. See, we are the ones who lived dishonorably. We, like Saul, have not kept God's word. We have not honored him with our life at certain times, and we have rejected the word of the Lord and rejected his sacrifice. But if you are still alive today, which I assume all of you are in this room, you have an opportunity to accept the sacrifice and to keep the word of the Lord by believing in his son. By so doing, you receive eternal life. You can live your life for his glory and honor, and you could be exalted to a place of honor by in his presence at the end of your life, rather than being cut off and removed from the family of the Lord. What would you rather have? David is one who shows us what it means to honor the dishonorable. I want to share this quick thing because I found it, and I found it very insightful in many ways. But we are called to show honor. See, God allowed Saul to die in dishonor because that's what he deserved. That is God's doing. We are not the judge. God is. So we are to show honor even when somebody is acting dishonorable. Husband, wives, do you show honor to your spouse when they are not acting honorably? Because God expects you and I to do so. What do you mean? My spouse is always honorable. Yes, she is. (laughs) Well, see, I'm smart. The reality is, is we all act dishonorably at different times, and we do not deserve the grace we've been shown by the Lord, and we do not deserve to be treated with honor at times. But just because we're acting dishonorably does not mean that the other person doesn't need to show honor, and we need to show honor when they are not acting honorably, because we are not their judge. We are to show honor. That's why the New Testament tells us, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That's a tough one, but it's a way of showing honor. Husbands, 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so your prayers may not be hindered. Do you know how the Greek word for honor is spelled transliterally? T-I-M-E. It's pronounced Tame, but it's transliterated time. That means to show honor to your wife means to give her time. It means to show value, to give an estimation of worth to the other person, showing that they are of highest value to you. Now, I don't know of a woman out there who does not see the validity of that statement that they feel most honored when their husband shows them T-I-M-E, time. And the same goes the other way. Wives show time, honor 
effort, value to your husband, even when they're acting like boneheads. Right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your holy word. And I pray, Lord, that you would help our families to be holy according to your word. Help us, Lord, to walk in truth, to check our main source of information, your holy word, and help us to be in line with your truth. Lord, I pray that we would be those who bless those who persecute you, that we would be those who show honor even when others aren't acting honorably as they could or should. But Lord, help us to live honorably, to show honor, to show grace. We thank you that your love covers a multitude of sins. Help us to speak well of those who have sinned against us. And Lord, help us to be like David, Lord, who showed great honor to someone who was very dishonorable to him. Thank you, Jesus, that we have been dishonorable, that you showed us great honor. Help us to follow you, to accept your sacrifice, and to keep your word. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.